one of the things that's really come across in, in what you've just been saying is how self-aware you are. And this has definitely been a thing I've noticed with your blog posts as well. And I'm curious as to what extent you think writing has helped you develop your self-awareness or to what extent it has been sort of a manifestation of your self-awareness? Um, that's a really good question and a really hard one to answer at the same time. Um, I think writing can impede self-awareness sometimes and, mm. but at the same time it can help it. Like it, it's, it's a weird one because I think if you live huge, predominantly in stories and in fiction, which a lot of the times in my life I have done and I'm still guilty of doing, you can miss the obvious about, you know, your own behavior or you can get so wrapped up in things that aren't real that you don't pay enough attention to what is real. But on the other hand, a, I think that a developed writer is always in conversation with who they are as a human being and with their journey as a human being. And, you know, even when you are writing about characters who seem a million miles away from you, you're usually in some way writing about yourself. I, I think the key to it is to identify that. You know, when I, was, when I was younger and I was writing a lot, I didn't really think about the ways in which the characters were me or were reflective of me. I was just thinking about, about writing and I would get caught up in the stories. And I think in some ways that, that impeded self-interrogation or self-awareness or whatever. Whereas when you sort of realize that you are ultimately writing about yourself and your experiences and your feelings and your beliefs, and you become more attuned to finding where those aspects are slipping into your stories, I think that helps self-awareness and that does help you kind of hold yourself to account and always try to hold yourself in perspective. And I think as well, you know, part of me is always aware of the fact that writing as a career is inherently ridiculous because you're just making up stuff that never actually happens and you're putting that on the page and you're really hoping that somebody will pay you for your strange, fantastical ramblings. It's like when you're a kid and you're making up stories to entertain your friends or you're, you're playing you know, cops and robbers or whatever it is. And you're coming up with whole epic narratives around characters you're playing and stuff, but it's like putting that on paper and asking people to pay for it and to think that it's worthwhile. And that's why, you know, it's that simultaneous thing where for everything that I say about truth and about reaching out to other people in the world and all of that. And I do believe that I also believe that at the end of the day, you're making stuff up. Don't take yourself that seriously. What you're doing doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. Like, I mean, it, it, it does and it will to some people if you've done it well, but you know, I think my fundamental belief of what, you should bear in mind as a writer is probably something along the lines of nobody in the world needs to hear your story. You know, don't listen to people when they say people need to hear your story because they don't, no one needs to hear your story, but if Absolutely. you tell it well enough, people might want to. And that's kind of the thing we all should be aspiring to. I think. That is good. I'm going to have to write that down as a quote somewhere. That is great. Um, what questions have you been dying for people to ask you about the hunted that haven't come up in interviews? whether because they are spoilery or just because they haven't been very well noticed aspects of the book. Is there anything that you think has been overlooked or perhaps looked at differently from how you were expecting? That's a really good question. Um, not that many people have asked me about the violence or the degree of the violence, which is interesting. Uh, there have been, now that the book is out, at least in digital, reviews are starting to come in on both Goodreads and on various things. I was really enjoying this book. It was a five-star read until the midway point, And then it just became torture porn or splatter porn or whatever else they want to call it. <laughs> and yeah, I, I don't think there's been that much interrogation of, of that or that many questions about that particular choice. The, the problem is I, I feel like I'm throwing myself under the bus here because I don't necessarily know that I have a really good answer for it. Apart from the fact that I've always been really influenced by kind of classic horror and by the ability to ho of horror to kind of push the envelope, but also sneak interesting pertinent points about humanity under the artifice of blood and gore and violence and, and all of that. Um, the decision to kill off Simon, I probably would have expected a bit more interrogation of because that was a really hard scene to write, particularly because in the earliest version of the story, you didn't see it. You know, you saw him get pulled out of the car. You saw them about to kill him. And that was where I left it for ages until Catherine Milne said to me, well, I think we need to see the hunters for a book called the hunted. We need to see them hunting. Yes. <laughs> and she was like, the only real place to put that is for them to hunt Simon. And I'm seeing, and, and like one thing I will, I will come back to this other point in one sec. So I'm just gonna put a pin in that. But like 
one thing that was really important to me was that we never see the perspectives of the hunters. I mean, the, the book's written in limited third person, but I never wanted to put anyone in the minds of any of the hunters. I wanted only to see the minds of our central characters. So that meant that seeing Simon get hunted could only happen from Simon's perspective. And the prospect of writing a character who knows he's going to die and is trying to run away and the whole thing's totally futile and he's being made a mockery and a game for these horrible people, particularly a character who is basically me, was something that gave me this like really visceral, horrible feeling that I was like, I don't want to write that. And that means I absolutely have to write that. You know, if I'm running away from it, then how can I expect to put the audience through the ringer if I'm not going to put myself through it? So I really went back and forth on how to write that scene. And then I sort of thought, it's going to be a fool's errand if I try to specifically write everything that's happened to him physically. So I try to plant the scene entirely in his thoughts and in this sort of fractured half dream, half reality sort of trauma, absolute terror, miasma of merged experience that he's going through at the time. And I'm really proud of that scene, I think for, for that reason. And, you know, the other thing is it's interesting because that question of perspective, just, just to quickly riff off this, because I do think it is something worth discussing, has been really interesting when it has come to adapting it into a film. And that's probably the other yeah. thing that I probably haven't had that many questions about is like the experience of actually taking, taking this story and somehow transitioning it into a totally different medium and yet trying to retain the heart of it. Because so much of that introspection you can't really have in film or not in the same way unless you want the characters to stop and deliver massive monologues about all of their inner (laughs) demons which you can't really get away with would feel Um, a little bit uh contrived if yeah as as someone is driving away from people trying to hunt them down they're like slipping back into some monologue about and i knew the bottle was waiting in the cellar for me all along yeah yeah, exactly exactly um but I mean, that's, that's like, you know, I mentioned the character of Greg before and Greg has been an unfortunate casualty of the adaptation process because no. he's one of those characters who exists in the book partly to underline the theme, but also partly to provide our eyes in the enemy camp, you know? Like he, yes. mm-hmm. he exists too because he sells out the main characters partway through. And then for the rest of the book, he's sort of there in the enemy camp and he's, he's essentially there to give eyes to what Trent and Janice and Kate and all the others are doing. But in the film, you don't need that because you can just show whatever you want to show. And so in the very first draft, I cut Greg and then the team behind it were like, we actually want Greg back. So I was like, okay. So I kind of went back to the screenplay and I threaded Greg back into it. And then when the director came on board, he was like, I think we need to cut Greg. Why is Greg even in this? And I was like, <laughs> well, I, I believe he had a reason for being in it in the, um, in the book, but in the film he didn't. So, so he's gone and... And then there's, there's a few other changes, but I don't want to spoil too much about what's going to be in the film because it's going to be a fairly faithful adaptation. But there's, uh, what I will say is that a lot of the deaths that have upset people in the book are a lot more violent in the film, like a way, way more messed up in the movie than they are in the book. So that's one thing. And um, the, yeah, the other thing is that it's been interesting because, you know, you've got to try to find different ways of articulating Frank's so so in the film Frank is explicitly a war veteran so that which was actually part of his character trait in the very first draft of the book I remember you talking about that on a podcast yeah so that was sort of a way to give him to sort of provide more shorthand for past Mm. regrets and for somebody who'd escaped a life of violence in, in a more explicit way than was evident in the book where he's just sort of come from a dodgy sketchy you know rough as guts rural backgrounds but the other difference is that, you know, we've had to try to find ways, particularly with Maggie, because I mean, and I know because I've read this in reviews that for some people, likability is an issue when it comes to Maggie. And I, I do get that because she is a difficult character and she's a character who doesn't necessarily make herself immediately a warm and cuddly presence I mean, or at all. <laughs> and, I, and I really love her, but I can also see how some of the things that she does can be off-putting to people, particularly when it comes to her leading Simon into danger. And I, I would argue that in the book, you do get to see her remorse and her regret. You do get to see her really struggling with that choice and with the consequence of that choice. And in future books, you'll see her struggling with that more because that's Mm. something that doesn't go away. That's something she's going to live with forever. But in the film, you know, we've had to kind of find ways to make things like that more explicit, you know, to, to add beats where you can really see that, but see it through action as opposed to seeing it through, you know, internal monologue because there is no internal monologue. So, so that's been a really interesting process. And I've got to say that the director of the film who hopefully will be announced really soon has been absolutely amazing in terms of like helping me. And I'm not a particularly visual person helping me kind of find ways to tell the same story in a more visual medium 
without getting to have the same degree of introspection or internal monologue that I can have in the book. Yeah, I, I'm curious to talk more about the film process. If there is anything else that you, you can discuss with it, yeah, well, obviously there is. Hit me up with stuff. questions. Uh, yeah, okay. out at you. yeah. I suppose like in terms of the, the chronology of it, are you imagining it unfolds in the same kind of back and forth way as the book? And if so, how are you going to distinguish those? Um, this might yeah, be too so, much detail, but yeah. No, no, that's okay. It's, um, that's been an ongoing question in terms of how to do it. Um, yeah, look, there, there was a version of it early on, and this, this was the same in the book as well, where it wasn't clearly delineated as then and now. It was established as just two parallel storylines oh, okay. with the, the half-baked idea in my head being that the reveal that Maggie was the girl in the roadhouse would be as a twist. And, sure. and I'm actually aware that for some readers it has been because she's never named as Maggie in the, in the present day stuff until about the midpoint of the story where she wakes up. Hmm. So I, it's funny because I have read a couple of reviews that have alluded to the fact that they found that surprise and that, that did land as a reveal. So I'm pretty happy with that. But, you know, I really love the idea that like, it's kind of like the first season of Westworld, you know, when you get to the end and you're kind of like, that character was that character all along. Oh my God. You know, and I, I kind of wanted to do, wanted that, but it, it, it was too contrived to make it work. And so early on in the film, I was thinking, well, maybe I can make that work. But basically one of the executives, I think it was John Berg, at Vertigo was just like, that's going to piss people off. Don't like, just make it clear from the start. I was like, cool, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm trying to be clever, but it's obviously, yeah, it's not working. Um, so I think at the moment, the way it's been done based on the storyboards and based on my conversation with the director is that there'll be a big, like, at the, you know, we'll start in the present day, same as the book. And it pretty much follows the same structure, but the first jump, I don't want to spoil like the cool visual choices, but then yeah, sure. there are also so many cool visual choices that are being made that this is just one of them. But like, you know, the part where Maggie collapses on the ground, then suddenly it just comes up on the screen, like this big then fills the screen and then you, nice. you fly through the words into like Simon's road trip. So that's kind of that's one sick. cool thing. And then a similar thing happens at the end of the first Simon Maggie thing with the now, but that doesn't happen because obviously as the story goes on, particularly with the way the film has been written, the then and now moments alternate. So it's more like we set up, okay, when you're following Simon and Maggie, it's in the past. When you're following Frank and Ali at the Roadhouse, it's in the present. And once that's been established through the big kind of full screen intertitles, we're sort of hoping that the audience will just be like, okay, cool, and go with it. So that's kind of, so at the moment it's following like a very, very similar structure. But, but yeah, like, you know, there's, um, there's just other changes that, you know, just have to be done to, to, um, to sort of fit the medium, you know, as I said, there are characters who have been cut from the film. There are extra characters who've been added into the film as well. There have been characters whose fates are very different in the film than they are in the book and vice versa. Uh, and ultimately, you know, there's, there's been a couple of choices. I, and I won't, I absolutely won't spoil this, but there have been a couple of choices made in the film that I'm looking at and I'm thinking, oh boy, if this works and if this is successful, then, and if, you know, the first film gets made and then more films get made, I am not going to be able to adapt the following books completely the same way. Because there are things that have happened that happen currently in the film that actually that are different to what happens in the book that will contradict later books. Oh. That won't line up with cool. later books. So that's really interesting because like I'm actually I'm totally okay with it, weirdly, because like when the director kind of pitched these ideas to me, I was like, look, ultimately. I don't think you can rob in any story. I don't think you can rob Peter to pay Paul. You know, I don't think you can, I don't think you can sort of take away from the story you're currently telling because you're like, Oh, but that's going to pay off down the line because you might not get a down the line. If the current story sucks, you know, yeah. I, I really am a strong believer in making sure that your, your first story is as good as humanly possible and then worry about the sequel. If, and when you get a sequel, you know, so I was fine with those choices, but it is interesting because, you know, the director and I've been kind of talking about how, it might end up being that there are two totally, par like if, if, and you know, I have to stress the big if, if both the book and the film are successful enough to warrant further excursions into this world, then it might end up being one of those things where, um, where there just are two completely different parallel Maggie sagas going on at the same time, because, so you know, cool. like for example, particularly the, my idea for the final book has been, greatly compromised by some of the choices in the film, which to me is really exciting because it makes me go, okay, cool. So how am I going to, you know, if, if we do get there, how do I make up the difference? So I have no idea yet, but I kind of like it. It's really exciting to me to have these sort of two alternate versions of the same story that ultimately 
best serve their own uh, respective mediums. What do you think will be the scene you're most looking forward to seeing in the movie? Oh, the scalping. A hundred percent the scalping. Heck yes. Like, it's That's just, it's great. gotta be the scalping. Um, I mean, there's so many and like, it's been really cool because I've, I've seen the first 40 minutes of the film have been animated through like animated storyboards, cool. like to, to music yeah. and to, um, to uh, sound effects and everything. So watching that has given me like a really... Like, obviously it's not the same as like seeing it with actors and everything, but it's given me a really clear idea of what the director's vision is and how the film's going to look and move and what I can say. And, you know, I, I need to stress. So, you know, like all, all the necessary forces are working to make this happen. So, you know, just, just, a, just to stipulate it, it you know, I, I'm really hoping it does and it's looking like it will, but nothing's a sure thing until it's a sure thing, particularly in Hollywood. Yeah. But what I will say is based on that animatic and based on what I've seen and based on, what the director's work has been so far this film is going to be so good like it's just the the visual choices the the stylistic nature of what i've seen so far the like clever little ways of the clever little visual storytelling methods that are being employed to to make this happen and also like the director's total understanding of the heart of the story you know all of these things that we're talking about about the the elements that give the, that lend the hunted more depth than your I mean, hopefully lend the hunted more depth in your standard run of the mill kind of horror thriller story uh, are completely understood by the team on board. And I, I'm so, so confident that the film fingers crossed, if it happens will be just a really fantastic visual encapsulation and sort of alternate version of this story told with my enthusiastic blessing because it's just i just think it's going to be so good i just think like we we have exactly the right person on board to make this happen and i think they're doing the most incredible job yeah i think it's going to be great and like even the fact that the book is yeah very filmic in nature it's it's short it's really fast paced and it has such a great visual quality to it as well do you know i don't know if you can give this as a detail but are you planning to film in australia or like what's the yeah um yeah. the so one thing that's kind of been really interesting is that obviously with the lockdown thing happening, um, which is all starting to lift at the time of recording, um, things are lifting in Australia sooner than they are lifting in other parts of the world, which in some ways I think has kind of made the hunted more of an appealing prospect for a lot of the creatives involved because this film can in theory be made a lot quicker than a lot of the other films that are on the slate of the same companies because it can be made entirely in Australia. Mm. So it will be, yeah, the, the film, like the film will be unquestionably Australian. It's going to have all those same themes about what it is to be Aussie, what it is to be, you know, all of those things are going to be in there because it will be filmed here. Uh, in terms of where it will be filmed, I don't yet know. There's been a couple of different locations that have been mooted and, you know, that's an ongoing discussion. Um, but basically look at the moment, it's once the casting is confirmed and particularly the casting of Frank and, Maggie, those are sort of the two characters who they're really locking down now. And there are some really, really exciting conversations going on with some, some absurdly talented people who like, you know, when like, yeah, it, it's you, you like, I am still having trouble believing who these people are, <laughs> but if, if those conversations go as positively as I hope they're going, then once that's locked, then everything else I think will fall into place really quickly. But again, you know, you just don't know. Like, it, you know, so many things could happen between now and then. And obviously, as this year has proved so far, things are madly unpredictable. So, you know, who, who knows at this point? You recently shared a clip on Twitter of you performing a Oscar-worthy scene from Jaws. Will we be seeing any of your acting in The Hunted? Um, I've... Okay, so the bit... One of my requests has been... You know the bit uh, when... Uh, I mentioned it before, when Frank blows up the roadhouse... And what I've written in the script is that the guy who's pouring the petrol under the door with the petrol nozzle is like just this bloke sitting there whistling as he's pouring petrol and some of the flames <laughs> race up the petrol nozzle and blow him away. I've asked, can I be that guy? Like, yes. I just want to be that guy. Um, I don't want a speaking role. Like, I, I'm too, inv obviously I'm too invested in this film doing well to try to subject anybody to my acting. <laughs> but um, Your acting but, is quality, yeah. man. That oh, American you, accent and jaws. Um, Oh yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, I uh, yeah, that was good fun. But um, I wouldn't. As as anybody who 
who sat through my performance in Dracula Last Voyage of the Demeter a few years ago <laughs> when, um, when I thought that I was doing a really passable impression of like Benedict Cumberbatch cross with Alan Rickman. <laughs> and I listened to the radio play recording later and I was like, no, I just sound really Australian. And I was trying to sound like the two most British men in the world. And I just sound like more Aussie than I sound. What in is my this Bogan doing in this? Yeah, English I know, right? Ship, just, yeah. like, anyway. Um, so no, I won't be, I definitely, I, I would love to be in it just briefly as somebody who dies horribly, but I, I'm not going to be like, I a hundred percent would not subject anybody to sitting through me actually trying to speak. Um, I'm not, as much as I love Quentin Tarantino, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that to people. I'm not going to do his, his old trick. That would be so great yeah. if you would be the, the petrol pour in that scene. I, can oh, imagine, I would yeah, love it. I would love it so much. That would be great. It just seems like the movie is such a such a dream come true from the... I mean, obviously, you know, like, it's still early days and everything, but it just seems like it's so, like, after, you know, like, how quickly you've gone from publishing Boone Shepherd to having, you know, these moments. And were there any moments within that kind of, within your writing journey? Because I know it's obviously not an overnight success thing. It's a you know, well over a decade that you've been writing. Were there any moments that you kind of felt like sluggish or not motivated to write? And was there anything that got you through those in particular? There's been a lot of those moments. And um, really, the only thing that ever really got me through was just, you know, because there've been so many moments where like, I've, I haven't really had a story to work on. You know, I haven't really had something that's like passionately, engaging me and that's kind of something i'm a little bit been, i've been a little bit been going through recently as well as just like not really having something that's i've got a lot of things that i've got to get finished for like you know pre pre-existing commitments but i haven't really had like a new thing that i've been really excited by and you know and i i, I guess i'd sort of have to just trust in experience there and be like that's happened a lot in the past and ultimately whenever it has happened i just have to trust that the story I want to tell next will come along when it comes along. It always does. Um, but you know, that like the other thing is like writing, feeling sluggish about your writing is one thing, but you know, writing can be demoralizing on a couple of levels because you know, sometimes, sometimes you sit there. I mean, I think, was it Thomas Harris wrote in one of his interviews where he talks about how sometimes you turn up, you sit at the desk and you wait and they just don't turn up. You know, the characters don't turn up. The story doesn't turn up. And what do you do then? There's nothing you can do. You know, you can't, you can try to force yourself through it. And sometimes I think if you force yourself, you'll eventually get into a rhythm where it'll start coming more naturally. But other times you're just forcing yourself to write stuff on the page. And if you're, if you're sitting there feeling like you're making it up then it often just means that it's not really organic and it's not really coming from anywhere. Mm. It's just nonsense that you've put together. But, um, but you know, the other thing of course is that, you know, like professional ses- setbacks can be hugely demoralizing and that can really, and you know, I've been lucky in that for the last little while I've pretty much, I haven't had any huge egregious professional setbacks. You know, my professional career has kind of taken off in really exciting ways in the last 12 months across the board in pretty much every department. But, you know, before that I had some real massive professional setbacks. I had like, I've written in blogs and stuff about how in 2018, you know, I had a succession of big things that kind of fell through all around the same time and left me with no kind of clear path forward or no, no project to really feel optimistic about. And I don't think I realized until I look back in retrospect, like how big a toll that took on me and sort of how in what a bad place that sort of left me. But you know, that that's also the thing where it's like, I say that and I'm like, I don't want to sound like I'm sitting here being like, you know, bemoaning my horrible circumstances because, you know, ultimately it's a career that I chose myself and that's the nature of the beast. And that just is writing. Unfortunately, you know, you can't, you can't just sit there and expect that everybody is going to, recognize your incredible genius because they're just not going to, you know, you have to make sure that you're writing stuff that's good enough or at least attention grabbing enough that people do sit up and say, okay, there is something here. And you know that, so I, I, I really do believe that like writers in general just can't let that stuff get to them. And if you do find yourself feeling sluggish for whatever reason, or you just feel like you're unmotivated or whatever, then you just have to find whatever tool is possible to get yourself out of that funk, whether it's just waiting for it to come back, but knowing it will come back or whether it's sitting down and forcing yourself to do something or whether it's doing writing exercises or whether often I find that just like watching a really good TV show or reading a really good book can have a huge impact on me because it kind of reinvigorates me. and makes me go, this is why I love doing this. Now I want to do more of this. So, you know, there's, there's, it's different for everyone. You know, I'm always kind of loath to sort of 
uh, no, I say I'm always loath to, but it's literally what I do in my blog all the time. <laughs> like, I guess I feel resistant about sort of handing out any explicit writing advice because I just think it's a process that's so different from everyone. I think I've got a lot of ideas about making a career as a writer, but when it comes to the actual writing process and what's good for people in terms of, you know, what, what's good for actual, what, what's good for you as a writer individually, that's just so different to everyone. You know, nobody has the same journey. It really comes back to self-awareness in that regard. Yeah, it really does. I think. You mentioned before that you have been thinking a little bit about the, the final book within the Maggie series. What is your kind of vision for this series? And I suppose, I know you're on a two book deal with HarperCollins at the moment. So again, it's, it's still up in the air to some extent, but what do you kind of in an ideal world hope that Maggie's series would, would be saying or exploring or turning out to be? Yeah, it's look, one thing, one thing I will say first and foremost is that the biggest lesson I think I learned from the Boone Shepherd books, and I learned a lot from the Boone Shepherd books, and I'm I remain very proud of the Boone Shepherd books. But the biggest lesson I learned from um, from the Boone series was particularly with the first Boone Shepherd. I ended that book on a massive cliffhanger, which in retrospect was profoundly arrogant because it basically was me assuming I was going to get a second, a third, and at the time a fourth as well. And then the first book, as I've said before, did well and obviously did well enough to justify two sequels. But for a while there, it didn't look like that was necessarily going to be the case. Mm. And that left me sitting there thinking, if there's not a second book, then I've just left with a big Boone Shepherd will return to be continued massive cliffhanger yeah. and that's the end. And that left me sitting there thinking, okay, like you're never guaranteed a sequel. Like you are just, you are never guaranteed a sequel. And it's so funny because I have writers who come to me for advice and say, look, I'm planning a three book series. I'm like, can you tell it in one book? Because if you can tell it in one book, tell it in one book. Trust me, just do it. Like, particularly if you're going for traditional publishing where, you know, the money it makes is a huge factor. You, you just like, if you can do it in one, do it in one. So that's why when I wrote the second Moon Shepherd book, I made sure that it ended in a conclusive place. Even though it didn't obviously resolve the story I wanted to resolve, I made sure that at least if that was the last one, it didn't leave the characters in a massive cliffhanger in the same way. So when it came to writing the Maggie series, I was very adamant that every book was a total standalone. So to me, it's really important that you can read these books in any order, that it doesn't matter where you start. If you read them in order, you'll sort of see the arc, but you know, it, I, I basically want to write a series of standalone thrillers where every book is Maggie ending up in a different situation told chronologically where, you know, the, the literal and figurative scars of the previous adventures do come back. Like they are relevant and they do matter. But, you know, for example, you're not really going to see Frank and Ali again, for example, you know, you're not really going to see any of the surviving characters in the inheritance again. You know, they, they, the characters will sort of be there. They'll turn up. Some of them might reappear down the line. I don't really have a strict rule on that, but you know, I, I really want to feel like at the end of every book, Maggie rides off into the sunset. And if that's the last time you see her, that's the last time you see her. You know, if that's the last time you see her, there's nothing, there's no huge hanging loose end that will really make you be like, oh, that's annoying. Um, and I mean, like I've noticed in some reviews or some, some commenters online have been talking about how they're like, oh, you don't find out where Maggie's money came from in The Hunted. And I was a bit like, oh, don't you? Because I thought it was pretty explicit that she stole it from her father. But then I'm like, I actually think that that line was cut in editing somewhere along the line. I don't remember so like, reading me it either, yeah. Yeah, okay, right. Well, all right, there's me on the record saying that she stole her money from her father before she killed her father. So I did don't think that was explicit. But anyway, that is all explained in the second book anyway. So that's me saying, I say there's no loose ends, but I think there is an accidental loose end, which I'm now um, <laughs> trying to explain. But, but yeah, I, I really want The Hunter to feel completely like a standalone story with the beginning, middle and an end. I want The Inheritance to be the same. I'm halfway through writing a draft of the third book at the moment, which I definitely want to feel the same. But the other thing is that I want all of them to be really different. You know, I don't want mm. anybody to feel like I'm writing the same book 20 times over. So while The Hunted is kind of a horror thriller sort of outback noir story, The Inheritance is more like a crime thriller, like an Elmore Leonard crime thriller. The third book is almost like The Da Vinci Code, like an Australian Da Vinci Code, but like one that jumps around in time. My idea for the fourth book is like full-on gothic horror, like set over one night, full-on gothic horror. I've got an idea for the fifth one, which is like a straight-up Western like just a full on isolate, like straight up middle of nowhere, Western. Nice. Uh, and then, and that's kind of as far as I've got, you know, I've got, and then I've got, I've got a very clear idea of what the final book will be. 
But what I don't know is how many books it will take me to get to the final book. You know, right. I mean, if uh, if The Hunted comes out and does okay, and if The Inheritance comes out and does okay, and then HarperCollins are like, we probably don't want another one, which you know, I don't know if that is a thing that happens or not, but that might happen. And if it does, then... I don't want the audience to feel like they've only got a chunk, a small chunk of the story. I want them to feel like, okay, well, we've got two complete stories here. And if that's all there is, that's all there is. But if I can keep telling stories about Maggie, then I'm going to keep telling, telling stories about Maggie. But I also know, as I learned with Bruin Shepherd, that there will be an end to the journey. And I think I know what the end is, but I'm aware that that end might change. It definitely did in the case of Bruin Shepherd. But ultimately, if I can tell a series of thrillers that are all standalones, are all vastly different in terms of genre, but ultimately chart a coherent through line narrative for this character, which in my mind is kind of a journey of moral reckoning of a character mm. who has come from a horrible, loveless background, slowly learning to come back into touch with her own humanity in some ways, but then there'll be complications along that journey in a lot of ways. And, you know, I, I don't want to, I, this is where I'll probably hold back because I don't want to spoil too much about where I want to go with it. But to, like, I don't want Maggie to be Jack Reacher, you know, she's not going to be the same character in every single book. You know, there is a really clear journey I want to take her on. There is a really clear arc I have in my head for her, but I want to write it in such a way that, as I said, it won't feel incomplete if you only read one or two books in that story, you know? Yeah, I think that's such an important point to underscore. I mean, I almost felt that a little bit with myself recently. I was, as you said, you know, I was like, oh, I'm going to write a seven book fantasy series. And I got to the end of the first draft of one and I was like, crap, this really doesn't work if you just stop reading here. And I don't know if people are going to have the patience to continue. So I decided to then go into something where it could be more standalone with each book while still having some sort of art. So, yeah. And yeah. that's the thing, you know, I always, I always point people to A New Hope, you know, and it, it was a few years ago when I, when I rewatched A New Hope and I was like, oh, if you watch this film by itself, you didn't know that there was a whole franchise around it. It is a perfectly satisfying, complete story with a beginning, yep. middle and an end. I mean, yeah, they don't defeat the empire, but they bought the Death Star. They destroy the main villains that we've seen. Like, you know, it's, it can be assumed that they go on to defeat the empire. Like you don't need more. And it was only when A New Hope became hugely, hugely successful that it was kind of retroactively made into episode four and part of this bigger story. But don't end on the map as if you don't get that second book, then you're the one who looks like an idiot, you know? Absolutely. And I think Matrix is a good example of that as well. Like first movie absolutely, is absolutely. incredibly standalone. And then arguably you could say that maybe it's an example of a slightly less good interpretation in the second and third movie, although they still do have a really satisfying arc when you look at them from like a very macro level. Um, but yeah, it's just such an important thing to like, I think as well, to be able to convince readers that you can stick the landing and to ha give them a satisfying Absolutely. end. Absolutely. And that's the thing, you know, I, don't, I mean, look, I've been somebody who has constrained myself. I'm not going to do this or I'm not going to do this. I'm, if I ended up in a position down the line where I was regularly selling enough, had enough to like, uh, uh, of the wind or a lot of the rings or you know big multi-story that explicitly is in multiple parts and i'm not i'm not ruling that out not for a second but i guess what i would say is that for now at this point in my career i feel more comfortable making every book i write the best it possibly be as a standalone whether or not it's part of a biggest i, I mean you know my writing art is probably tana french and you look at like all of her books even though her first six books are a series and there is there are thematic preoccupations that are through all of them. And there is a through the series in terms of flaws and the different ways it dealt with what it is to be a detective. They are all standalone. You can read all of them by themselves and you don't need to read the others. And if you do, oh, you can read in any order and you'll still have a great time. But if you read them in the order in which they're written, read all of them, you'll have a more complete experience. And that's pretty much what I'm going for with the Maggie books. Makes a lot of sense. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask a couple of quick questions about your kind of writing process uh, in general. I, I know you mentioned that you don't like to give prescriptive writing advice, but I think it's always useful to just see how other authors do their thing. Um, and in particular, you know, if anything has changed since last time we've talked about your writing. So how do you structure your day as a writer? You work full time as a writer. What does your current writing routine look like? And how have you managed to, yeah, I suppose just balance everything that you need to do within the job of being a full-time author? I, 
I tend to follow like a, I always have like a to-do list that I sort of set up for every day. And that includes just like, you know, general things I do in the morning, like, you know, uh, like, you know, different bits and pieces. And, you know, I always make time to read a little bit and watch a little bit every day. But of course the bulk of the day has to be put over to writing work. Um, so part of my days at the moment, like I sort of go through my morning stuff and then I sit down at my desk and then I sort of look over the work I've got to do get up to make a cup of tea, go to the jigsaw puzzle that's on the table. And then I spend an hour at the jigsaw puzzle. And then I go, oh crap, I've got to write. Then I go back and I sit down. Then I sit there and I read over what I was supposed to be working on. And then I go, oh, I have a cup of tea. Then I go back to the cup of tea. Then suddenly it's two hours later. I'm still working on the jigsaw puzzle. Then I go back to the desk. And then maybe I write a hundred words. And then I realize that it's five o'clock. It's time to have a beer. So <laughs> moments, but I, I, I think that's probably a symptom of the whole isolation thing more than anything else. Um, mm. It's also a symptom of the fact that like, at the time of speaking, I've got a very like, it's, I'm working TV series at the moment for a cool. big company, which is really great. It's like, it's been, it's been awesome, like financially and it's been an awesome big job. And I'm really excited about it. At the moment, I don't think I can set a pilot that's getting quite a bit of buzz. And now I'm writing a Bible for it. And that is proving for the last few I have of telling I'm going to have to you tomorrow and then tomorrow it's not ready yet um so like look honestly it's like I don't have a set writing process like day by day I really I wish I did, but like I, I I try to write something every day but I, I used to beat myself up if I didn't write a thousand words a day. You know, if I didn't write at least a thousand mm. words every day, I would beat myself up. Whereas nowadays I'm just so much more of the fact that like, I've got so many responsibilities in terms of, you know, not only do I have the TV stuff, film stuff, I've got hunted, I've got my theater work, and then I've got other bits and pieces sort of bubbling along the background. And, you know, and a lot of these things exist, pre-existing I have to find time to write new things as well, because if I don't write new things, then I'm not going to kind of be able to sustain the career that I want to sustain. So I'm really trying to like regiment my time to pick things up and say, hey, today I'm going to work on this, today I'm going to work on this. And you know, I have good writing, I have bad writing days. And I have days where I write easily and it'll be totally effortless. But other days where I struggle to get 500 out, you know? And I think for a while there, I prided myself on being prolific and I'm writing lots every day. But I've also realized recently that holding myself to the standard is a force myself to write a thousand words or more every day, then a lot of the time thousand words are just gonna be crap and unusable. So, you know, I, I I guess I just sort of read that Thomas Harris interview and I think, okay, I'm gonna sit I'm gonna make myself write at least a little bit. The projected is that I I have to, you know, as the closest deadline, I guess. And to move, you know, if it starts to kind of flow clearly and everything, I'll sit down and I'll write quite a bit. And if it doesn't, then you know I guess I'll come back another day because some things, some projects don't flow one day and they'll flow another day. Um, you know, then I, I guess I've, at the moment I've really found Lucas Betrayal, for example, which was my radio play project that came out earlier in the year. Like I wrote that in three days last year and I wrote it because I had a week in which I didn't have anything else due. And I was like, I just need to write something that nothing to do with me, has nothing to do with my this TV project. I need to write something that was totally for me and had no clear end game, no clear reason to, I was like, I just want to write this. And I'd had the idea in my head for a long time. It was a sequel to an old player. And so I just sort of bounced, met up for the actor who played Robert Stone, the protagonist in both the original play and Luke's portrayal. I pitched him my, we bounced a couple of things around. And then I went to the pub and I just sat there and I wrote 4,000 words. And I wrote another 4,000 words. And with the next day I wrote another one. And that was it. And then I finished it's like, there it is. And I the past, they recorded as a radio the library and that was it. And like, that was really exhilarating because the project that wasn't for anything. And that, that I think is my biggest struggle at the moment is like to keep writing things that like aren't for paperwork or aren't for anything except me because Luke's Betrayal, I only wrote because I want to write that. And that kind of writing something that was purely for passion kind of reinvigorated me for writing everything else. And it's not to say that my other work is, I'm not passionate about my other work. Of course I am. Hmm. And the moment writing becomes a job, you know, it just, you ultimately, you just need to still write other things, jobs, things that are just hobbies, things that are just fun and that you just exist because they do. So, so I'm having fun with a couple of those projects, but it's just so funny nowadays how like 
even those projects can blow up. Like a few weeks ago, <laughs> I got the mate of my actor who's part of my production company, and I said to him, "Hey, what if we make an ice? What if we make a web series in isolation?" Like, and the whole premise was, you know, we can get together a few talented actors, a few talented writers, we can write this series, and the whole idea is that it's a girl who's been living in Germany for years, and the first episode is she. Skype call from her brother. She hasn't spoken to her brother in a while. And her brother kind of, they've got this really awkward relationship and you're not really sure what's going on with them. And about halfway through the call, she sort of admits to him that she's been two years and he's sort of really pretty. Oh, wow, you know, that's amazing, that's amazing. Okay, look, anyway, I've got to tell you the real reason I called you is that your ex-boyfriend's gone missing. And she's like, what do, what do you mean he's gone missing? And she's, she's like, yeah, she's gone missing. I'm just going to tell you. And I don't want you to be looking into this. I don't want you to upset his family. You know why you shouldn't talk to them. Just leave it. You know what happened in the past. Just leave it. She goes, yeah, okay, I'll leave it. I'll leave it. I'll leave it. Anyway, I've got to go. I've got to go to work. All of that. He hangs up. He picks up the bottle of scotch he's had off camera and swigs. And that was the idea I had. And I wrote a pilot episode that could be done just entirely like we're doing now, you know, just like filmed on Zoom, recorded, just get some good actors to do it. And every this is what I've got. I'm doing this for fun. And I said to my mate, like, why don't we just make this? Like, everyone's isolating. Every talented actor we know isn't in right now. I've got writers who want to do it. Let's just do it. So we thought, yep, let's do eight episodes. We're getting a bunch of actors we want to, you know, it was a fun project. I got really passionate about it for a few days. I, I still am, but like, I was really just kind of like, this is going to be the best thing ever. And then it just like, it just snowballed. Like it just became this huge thing. We got a mad, like insanely good director on board. The episode ballooned from like six or eight to like 16. Um, thing we knew we had a major production company who came in and optioned it. Um, and now like it's, it's doing the rounds in LA as we speak and it's like, oh, okay. so that went very quickly from like a fun kind of, Hey, this will be like a fun hobby project. To be <laughs> like, Oh, now this is work as well. So you wow. know, just that kind of, which uh, that probably sounds like a humble brag or, or even just a brag. And it's not meant to be. It's more just saying that like, the thing is that like when writing comes to your job and like what you do for fun, I still do it for fun. Like what you do for fun and what you do for work are still the same thing. And then you kind of come up with something that you really like, and then you sort of put it to some of the contact. It can just quickly become, and then you um, sort of find time to work on things as much as you can. like it's it's weird. It's it's a different it's a different way of approaching writing. Than I've ever done it before, but it's mm. you know, I guess what you have to do the moment it paid work. That is so cool because yeah, I saw some early tweets about that web series, and I was I was waiting for it, and then like things sort of went quiet, and then yeah, oh that's that's insanely cool that it's blown up. And I suppose, yeah, it is super topical and there are probably tons of people who would, yeah, really relate to, to that experience and to, yeah, all of the, I suppose, conflicts that isolation has brought out and everything. How have you been coping within isolation? Oh, it's been, I've been fine. It's just, um, it's, it's a weird one because like, I guess it's just not that different to my normal way of living because I work from home anyway. <laughs> so like, I, I mean, I've liked it, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that with, like I live with my partner in a few houses and we, you know, we all have a really, so, I mean, you know, I think maybe all curdled a little bit, like the, the jokes have just become progressively worse and, yeah. you know, we've, we've sort of fallen into having a lot of the same conversations again and again, but you know, we've been watching a lot of movies. I've been reading a lot. Um, and you know, I pretty much I just have my daily routine. You know, I take my dog for a walk. I, um, you know, do my writing. I try to make sure I find, read and thing every day but i miss pubs you know I, I i'm a pub writer i really like going out somewhere and sitting there and writing like you know i'm weirdly out of writing in like grimy old pokies. for some reason there's just like a, okay. i don't know if it's like a that permeates the air or something that like i just feed <laughs> off like, i don't know if it's a horrible thing to say but like, I, I feel like my writing is going to get better when i can write elsewhere again in a cafe or like i I think in the grand scheme of things, I do most, I've always done most of my writing out of the house. So mm. to be in a position where I have to do it all in the house probably hasn't been that great for creativity. But, um, and also I just don't think you get inspired when you sort of see the same things again and again, but I love puzzles. So that's, um, that's been my, you know, my biggest escape time, but no, it's been all right. Like, you know, and, and I say that as somebody who, you know, is unquestionably one of the lucky ones in that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still in, it has an impact on life enormously but like i'm also i've all so many people who i know who particularly in the arts who have you know really been impacted by this and really you know it, it's kind of seen i don't want to sort of turn this into a covid discussion because we've heard enough about it but 
sobering and really horrible to see kind of the impact it's having on a lot of people, particularly in our industry. Like it's really, it, it's really, really rough. And particularly for booksellers and, you know, booksellers have done an amazing job kind of keeping active and delivering making sure that people are having access to things that they can read and things to keep them entertained. And, you know, it's, it's, it's inspiring really for people. And I don't want to say that horrible word unprecedented, but the fact of it is, you know, none of us have ever been through this before. Yeah. I mean, it has yeah definitely been an interesting time. And I suppose, yeah, as creators, we are, we are fortunate in a lot of ways. Um, I suppose getting towards the end of this conversation now, I want to take you back to Boone Shepherd here because I don't know if yes. I've told you this before. But inside, I have your signature here. Hey! I bought this book. I am. Yeah, that's your signature. Um, I bought it when I was on exchange in London and I saw a Sans Pants radio play in Birmingham and they had oh. copies of your book here. And this was the last copy that they sold on the tour. So... Oh, that's awesome. That. But, there you um, go. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's pretty cool to think that like, in this, this came out in, uh, I think it was 2016. When you were signing your signature in this book, did you think that you would be where you are at now with your writing? Um, oh, but I think I hoped I would be, is probably the best way to put it. Um, I think I hoped I would be here, but I also didn't know what here would look like. You know, I mean, I always, mm. I always, you know, of course, and of course I always wanted the big book deal and I wanted the film deal and I wanted all the things that every writer wants, really, even if they say they don't. But I... I don't know that I always like, indulge in a comfortable level of delusion that I would get there. But if, if you really ask me in like my darkest moments, like in my heart of heart, did I believe I would get here? I don't know that I did. Uh, I hoped I wouldn't. I think I worked towards it, but I think on some level, part of me always suspected it was kind of a pipe dream that would never really happen. But, um, but no, I mean, I, I hope for it and I worked for it and I definitely, you know, applied everything I had to, to getting there. So I'm, I'm really proud that I am, but I, I don't know in those early days I, I ever really believed I would, if that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Gabe, this has been an amazing chat. It's been very inspiring for me and it's been great to have such a deep dive into The Hunted. Um, I will, before I close this out, I'll give everyone links to The Hunter and your website and anything. Is there anything else that you want to close on or discuss as we finish up this? No, not, not really. I think we've covered, I mean, it's, it's always so weird because, you know, you think, oh yeah, spoiler filled chat, you know, I'm going to dive deep into everything and then it's sort of yeah. cover everything. It's like, I don't really know what else. And I'm sure that like tomorrow I'll be like, oh crap, I should have spoke about that. Um, but no, I think, I think we covered heaps and, you know, like, I mean, I'm always available on Twitter and stuff. If people, you know, want to express their outrage about the book, talk about killing off this character or that character or whatever. So I'm always totally, totally cool to have those conversations. Um, and you know, like, yeah, please just like, if you've read the book, like, let me know, send me, send me a tweet, send me an email, anything. Um, I'm just always excited to hear that anybody's read it, whether you liked it or didn't like it, you know, at the end of the day. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks so much for this chat, Gabe. This has been wonderful. Thanks again. Thanks for having me again, Jed. Thanks so much for listening to the show. I had a blast doing this interview with Gabe. I always love talking with him and he is an amazing communicator, really passionate and self-aware about his writing. Always a pleasure to talk to. If you haven't already read The Hunted, I would highly recommend picking it up. Um, and if you have read The Hunted and you enjoyed it, you may be interested in my own novel, Fires of the Dead. Fires of the Dead is a fantasy novella, a number one bestseller on Amazon in the fantasy adventure fiction category. And it's been described as the perfect read for someone looking to be immersed in a magic system unlike anything else. So it's not a thriller like The Hunted, but it does have a lot of the thrilling, pulse-pounding aspects of The Hunted. It's about Wisp, a magician who draws energy from fires to make his own flames. Leading a misfit thieving crew, he enters a desolate wasteland to steal a dead sorcerer's skull. But his crew aren't the only ones on the hunt, and the forest isn't as barren as it seems. So Fires of the Dead, it's a grimdark fantasy novella, and if you're looking for something that has that same really fast-paced, twisting plot as Gabriel Bergmoser's The Hunted, I highly recommend that you give it a crack. So thank you so much for listening to this. If there was anything particularly interesting that you'd learned from this interview, any different approaches to writing, or just thoughts that this conversation gave you, let me know on Twitter. You can reach me at Jed Hearn, that's J-E-D-H-E-R-N-E, or you can reach Gabriel Bergmoser 
on his Twitter at GoBergMoser. The links to that are in the show notes if you want to check out the spellings, along with the links to Gabe's books and his website, so you can check out all of that in the show notes for this. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Now go and write extraordinary stories. I'll see you next time.